Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carl Teichman. I'm Director of Government and Community Relations with Illinois Wesleyan, and it's the university and the museum that jointly sponsor um, the Lunch and Learn series. Um, today, our Lunch and Learn is Birds of a Feather Flock Together. Where do birds nest in Bloomington Normal? Um, and um, I wanted to uh, mention that uh, uh, we'll have uh, time at the end for question and an answer, um, but uh, it would probably be very easy and more productive if you do have a question, if you could put it um, using, uh, or if you could pose it using the chat feature, which is at the bottom of the screen. So feel free to uh, type your questions in and we'll take them uh, in the order uh, that they came in um, uh, from, uh, from the, provide, uh, from the uh, participants. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague and friend, uh, Given Harper. Given is the Ella Beach Lewis uh, Professor of Biology at Illinois Wesleyan, and he is also very active in the conservation movement, um, both locally and in the state. And so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Given. Given? Well, thank you, Carl. And I'm really um, excited to, to be here with you today. And what I'm going to do is talk about, uh, summarize the results of a two-year breeding bird survey that we conducted in Bloomington and Normal. So I uh, involved two Illinois Wesleyan students with all aspects of this research project. So Leah Beinick is the person, the student on the left. She's an environmental studies major um, she's also actually, uh, uh, and she won a national Udall scholarship. Uh, she will graduate at the end of the spring semester. And then another student who assisted was Rachel Shoniker, who graduated last year as a biology major. So they helped uh, with the inception, uh, at, the, at the inception of this project in, in designing it, in conducting bird surveys, in analyzing data, and then we're actually working on a paper that we'll publish uh, about it in a scientific journal. So why, do, why study urban breeding birds? Uh, Jeff Walk is the Director of Conservation Science for the Illinois Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. And he and some colleagues published a study in 2010 that uh, summarized how populations of birds in Illinois have changed over the past century. And in their, one of their major findings was that urban areas are increasingly important for breeding birds. Now, one of his collaborators on that project was Michael Ward, and he and his colleagues in 2018 published a scientific paper um, that indicated that many bird species that increased over this past century, they did so by the, increasing their use of urban areas, while the declining species declined most in the agricultural and grassland areas of Illinois. So as most of us know, certainly you're out and about uh, outside Bloomington Normal, McLean County is um, about 82% intensive row crop agriculture. Uh, it's comprised of, of corn and soybeans. Uh, certainly this provides a big economic boost, but as habitat for birds, um, it's, it's, it's actually lacking. So it's really uh, most agricultural areas, intensive row crop agriculture, they're not suited uh, as breeding habitat for most bird species. So another reason to study urban breeding birds, um, there was a paper published by Ken Rosenberg and colleagues from Cornell University in 2019. Uh, that study gave an astounding fact that bird populations are declining. There's been a 20, 29% loss in abundance of North American bird populations since 1970. And, and that is really disturbing. So if you look at the graph, uh, 
here on the right and I can highlight with my um, cursor. So on the right, this is, well, the, the um, horizontal axis is the change, percent change since 1970. And birds of different habitats, and this is for all of North America. Uh, wetland birds are an exception. Their, their populations have increased since 1970. But birds that nest along coasts, birds that nest in arid lands, particularly in the west and southwest, um, birds have declined that nest in eastern forest and then forest generalists, different types of forest, uh, habitat generalist birds that nest actually in multiple habitats, their populations have declined, as well as birds that nest on the Arctic tundra, birds that nest in western forests, and also the boreal forest. This is the big coniferous forest in the northern United States and Canada. And then the birds that, that, that have declined the most in North America are the grassland birds. The key factor in the decline of, of populations of all of these birds is habitat loss. So I mentioned Michael Ward's paper. Um, Michael Ward in that paper found that alternative habitat may allow species to persist. Their, their primary habitat may have been reduced or destroyed, but they can still persist in alternate habitats. And urban areas are important uh, alternate habitats. So how did we conduct this survey? Well, we uh, conducted it in the summers of 2019 and 2020. Uh, it involved some really early morning hours. Uh, we started the surveys up to one half hour before sunrise and we finished them by 10.30 a.m. I think that both Leah and Rachel uh, certainly learned that um, you need to go to bed a little early in order to get up early and do it on multiple days. Um, we used a method called um, the point count method. So we placed transects in areas that we surveyed and we put points on the transects that are, were approximately 100 yards apart. And we would go to each of these points and listen and look for birds. And all birds that we saw or heard for three minutes within uh, an approximate 55 yard radius, we recorded. So these are some examples of our transects. On the left, this is the South Fell Avenue transect. It extended from West Vernon Avenue down to West Virginia Avenue. And each of these dots is a point and they're about oh, 100 yards apart. For some of the larger areas such as parks, we had multiple transects. So Maxwell Park, for example, had two transects. Um, Maxwell is basically encompassed by North Parkside by West College, and then by Interstate 55 on the west. And we had a transect in the northern part of the park uh, through part of the Frisbee Golf Course, and then in an important shrubland area near the interstate. And I'm gonna um, highlight this area and talk about it more later. So our surveys were conducted from June 1st to the first week of July, and this is the time that, that most of the birds in this area are breeding. We established 42 survey transects, and in 2019, we ran replicate surveys on 10% of those transects, but in 2020, we decided it would be best to replicate all of the transects. We, Leah, Rachel, and I were, were able to, to survey roughly half the transects. We, this was also dependent upon having good weather, but we could not have done this uh, without the assistance of 11 local birding experts. 
They're really top-notch birders. Um, they, they're citizen scientists and they, they helped us and I'll acknowledge those um, at the end of the talk. So we place these transects in different uh, parks, different size parks, and also in neighborhoods of, of different ages, well-established neighborhoods, recently established neighborhoods, and so forth. Um, in addition to our bird surveys, we also um, measured aspects of, of habitat, for example, tree height, canopy cover, and so forth. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the ha those habitat analyses today, uh, but we, we are in the process of analyzing them. So here are our results. We saw 78 species that nested in Bloomington Normal over the two year period. And there were 8,464 bird sightings. I guess it, it's not really unexpected. Our most common species that was observed was the American robin. Uh, the second most common species was the European starling. Um, this is a bird, an introduced bird. It actually is, is invasive. It outcompetes native birds for nesting in tree cavities, but they're, they're quite abundant. Um, and then the third most common species that we observed was the red-winged blackbird. And those are typically found in marshy areas, cattails around ponds, um, and so forth. So which areas had the greatest number of species? Um, we actually surveyed two golf courses, uh, Ironwood and the Den. And the Den golf course um, had the greatest number of species. We, we documented 50 species that were nesting there. Um, this is, is one of the species that we observed, this beautiful red-headed woodpecker. Um, this was the only place in Bloomington Normal that we saw this particular species. And I also have to say that certainly the, the, the golf course superintendents were very nice. They allowed us to, to have golf carts and this is the first time in my life that I've birded on a golf cart. We would just take our cart from one point to the other on the transect and bird. It, it was living. Um, the second areas, uh, the, the second area with the greatest number of species tied with Maxwell and Tipton parks with 32 species. And an example of a species we found at Tipton in and around the lakes there and along the creek was the green heron, uh, a small heron that, that fishes, that, that catches fish and frogs. And then White Oak Park uh, was third with 31 different species. We were quite pleased to find that Bloomington Normal hosts 15 species of greatest conservation need. So these are species that are either state endangered or state threatened species, or they're rare, or they have declining populations. So we'll go over these uh, species of greatest conservation need, starting on the upper left, the ring-necked pheasant. This is also uh, an introduced species. It was introduced as a game bird um, they require um, grassland habitat. We observed documented bald eagles, which was pretty exciting. And actually, I'll talk more about bald eagles uh, in a bit. Yellow-billed cuckoos. These are, are small birds that we only saw in 2020. We didn't see any in 2019. Um, they are known to feed heavily on caterpillars. And the next two species here are called aerial insectivores. These are birds that fly and catch insects in their mouths while in flight. Uh, the first of these is the common nighthawk. Common nighthawks uh, historically would nest on rooftops of buildings, but the rooftops, the roof had gravel on the top of it. But fewer buildings today 
um, use that. They're, they're using just rubber mats and, and actually it's too hot for the nighthawks to nest. So nighthawk populations certainly are declining. Um, the next bird is the chimney swift. Chimney swifts are amazing birds. They fly around all day. They do not land. Um, they historically nested in tree cavities, but they also adapted to humans. So they will actually, a pair of chimney swifts will fly down an open chimney. They'll attach a nest to the inner wall of the chimney with their saliva. They'll take sticks and grass and they'll attach it to the inner wall of the chimney and they fly up and out of that chimney. But because uh, I think more chimneys are capped today, so there, there are fewer nesting sites for chimney swifts. Another species we observed is a woodpecker, the northern flicker. This is a cavity nesting bird. They're, they're quite striking. And when this one flies, um, this has yellow on the underside uh, of the wings. Another species was the wood thrush. The wood thrush is related to the American robin. We also saw a neat little bird has a beautiful song called the Bell's Vireo. Here's the brown thrasher. The brown thrasher is in a group of birds known for mimicking other bird songs. And it's, it's a rather striking bird. Brown thrashers you tend to find near shrublands, as well as this species. This is the uh, yellow-breasted chat, which was uh, closely associated with warblers. The eastern towhee and the field sparrow are also found in, in sort of brushy, grassy areas. And then the next three species here on the bottom are grassland birds. So we saw Henslow sparrows, dick sissels, and meadowlarks. And in particular, the, uh, we saw a Henslow sparrow in a restored prairie, and the dick sissels and meadowlarks we saw in the rough areas of both golf courses. Maxwell Park contains actually some very unique habitat. It consists of, uh, in this area encompassed by the circle, of shrubland. There's very little shrubland uh, remaining actually in McLean County. And we documented four species only at this site uh, in the shrubland, the Bell's Vireo, the yellow-breasted chat, and the field sparrow. And again, those are species of greatest conservation need, and also the blue grosbeak. So the main shrub that you find in this part of Maxwell Park is called the gray dogwood. Um, these were intentionally planted uh, there, I believe, back in the 1980s. They provide marvelous habitat. The birds nest in there. And then actually in the fall, birds will come and feed on the berries. So in Maxwell Park, in this portion, there's a disc golf course, and that disc golf course is slated to be expanded into the shrubland. So we've talked to um, uh, Doug Damery and the parks people and also the designer of the disc golf course in an effort to try to um, minimize any habitat loss uh, of the shrubland because it's, it's, it's really important habitat and they seemed uh, amenable to, to our suggestions. We found two species that are historically have been southern birds, but they're, they're shifting their ranges northward. And the first is a fish crow. A fish crow looks like the American crow that we have here year round. They're a little bit smaller than the American crow. You can, they're hard to tell apart, but you can actually um, tell, uh, distinguish them by their call. They don't have this raucous, the caw, caw. Instead, they have a call that goes something like,
so they're they're now nesting in normal. Um, I have taken students in my field ornithology class, and they're fairly common in southern Illinois. But again, they're they're expanding their range. And another species that is expanding its range north is the blue grosbeak. These are striking birds. Um, this is a male. It has this rusty red uh, on the the wing. It somewhat um, resembles an indigo bunting that also nests here, but the the uh, beak is larger, and you have the reddish um, on the males. We have compared our results with um, the USGS, US Geological Survey, has uh, implemented a breeding bird survey in the rural areas of the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and this was started in 1965. And if you look over here, each of these um, dots represents um, a breeding bird survey route in a rural part of um, the US, Canada, or Mexico. So I've actually, uh, I'm from Kentucky, and I've participated in breeding bird surveys there, and I'm starting a, a new route here in Illinois this next year. But those routes, you drive um, 25 miles, you stop every half mile, and then you count birds that are seen or heard for three minutes within a quarter of a mile radius. So we chose six BBS routes in central Illinois that are surrounded by agriculture, and we looked at the past five years of data. Now, one way that we compared these, oops, is we calculated what's known as a Shannon diversity uh, index. This takes into account uh, species abundance, but it also takes into account relative abundance. Um, the, basically, for our purposes, just the higher the value for the Shannon diversity index, that means uh, more species. So here's the Shannon diversity index for blooming to normal. And of the six BBS routes, uh, Bloomington Normal had higher species diversity than four of the six routes. It was higher than uh, Leroy, Waynesville, Deer Creek, and Fairbury. Uh, only Mackinac and Gridley uh, had higher species diversity. So we were actually uh, a bit surprised by this and, and quite pleased. We know that we did not um, document all species that nested in Bloomington and Normal, and I'll give you a few examples. Um, this is the Eastern Screech Owl. Uh, we, did, we did not do owl surveys. Um, the Eastern Screech Owl is about 10 inches tall, uh, beautiful little birds that come in colors either red, gray, or brown. And I have a nest box in my backyard in which I've had screech owls nesting for the past 26 or 27 years. And I also uh, have installed a video camera under the, the roof of the nest box. And this is actually a photograph of one roosting in my box from three days ago. And actually, I looked this morning, and it, it's there as well. Um, I'm, I get really excited, especially when they, they nest in the box because you can see the parents come in and feed the young. You can see the number of eggs. So here's the bird, it's facing forward. Here are the little ear tufts. Uh, and then here's actually a roost just um, right underneath the entrance hole. Uh, this is a young screech owl that had fledged, not from my box, this had fledged, had left the nest and, and unfortunately landed in the road near along Glen Avenue. So a homeowner called me over and I actually rescued it. I picked it up. It was, it was not harmed. I placed it in a tree and I'm pretty sure it did um, quite fine. Great horned owls nest in Ewing Park. They have for years and also in other locations. I, I know of a pair that um, 
I've been calling quite frequently in North Normal. Owls do not build um, their a nest. They'll use, great horned owls will use an old crow nest or an old hawk nest or even a huge cavity in a tree. They're large birds, uh, up to two feet tall. And I, I had an injured great horned owl one year that had a five foot wingspan. So these are really large, powerful birds. Female great horns will potentially be incubating eggs um, in, by mid-January. And I know that uh, one nest several years ago in Bloomington, we had a huge blizzard. And I wonder just how in, in the world will these great horns uh, raise young through this blizzard, but they did. And so I have to go off on a brief tangent. Um, Gene and I had the marvelous opportunity to take 24 Illinois Wesleyan students to Barcelona last year. But when COVID hit, we came home rather hastily uh, in mid-March. And, and obviously that was a bit of a downer, although fortunately no one contracted the disease. But Jean had a phone call from a teacher friend of hers who lives in Hudson and a, a great horned owl chick had fallen from the nest. So great horned chicks leave the nest, they fledge when they're about six weeks old. This one was about, I guesstimate, three to three and a half weeks old. And so it, it could not fly. Uh, the parents would feed it on the ground, but it's also vulnerable to predators. And one of the homeowners had seen a fox in the neighborhood. So I went out and collected it from the ground and fed it a little bit of raw chicken. Um, the nest was in the top of a pine tree in an old crow nest, but it was pretty high up. And also great horned owls are, can vigorously defend. They will actually fly and, and hit you in trying to protect their young. So I strapped a board here on the branches on the bottom of the tree that contain the nest. I put the chick up on top of the platform. The homeowner had a game camera that she put out and actually the parents came in and fed it and the young great horn pledged it, it, it left the nest. So, so that made it a little better COVID year. Another species that um, nests in town that, that we missed on our survey is red-shouldered hawks. Now, red-shouldered hawks are a little bit smaller than, than the large red-tailed hawks that you often see along the interstate. They nest typically in trees along streams, but the first known nest, the first nest that we are aware of in recent times in McLean County actually occurred three years ago in Bloomington on Clinton Avenue. And those birds have actually nested there ever since. Um, the homeowner, uh, the nest was, was in her front yard. One of the young fledged, left the nest, um, and came, was very close to Clinton Avenue, and she was, it was on the ground. She was afraid it might be run over. So I came over and picked it up and put it up in a tree in her backyard. and it also made it successfully. And last year, um, a least bittern, which is a small um, uh, heron-like bird, it nested at White Oak Park. It's also a species in greatest need of conservation. So we, 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 were, we didn't get this on our survey, but we were really excited uh, for it to nest there. We did see bald eagles um, on our surveys, and I am actually happy to report that there is a bald eagle nest within the city limits of Bloomington. It was several years ago that um, a homeowner, the, the mother of a Wesleyan alum, called me and said, I have an eagle nest on our property and you're welcome to come and see it. And I thanked her and, and I thought, well, you know, it, it's more likely a red-tailed hawk nest. But when I drove um, out to see it, oh my, this nest was probably close to three feet tall, 
five and a half to six feet wide up in a huge bur oak tree. Really, really impressive. And um, this is a bald eagles are a real success story. I know that we're talking that a lot of North American bird populations have declined. Bald eagle populations have increased. When DDT was banned, um, this DDT was a pesticide that uh, was sprayed widespread and it would make its way up the food chain into fish that the eagles ate. And this would cause eagles to lay eggs with thin eggshells. And when females would attempt to incubate the eggs, the eggs would crack. So DDT was banned and bald eagle populations have just increased dramatically. You can see them over town in the winter. They, they actually will come in town to catch rabbits and squirrels and they will all also feed on uh, road-killed animals. So why should we be concerned about birds? Um, there are a number of reasons. Well, first, birds are absolutely exquisite. Uh, I encourage you, if you're interested, take up bird watching. Uh, the spring birds, when the males are, are in their bright breeding plumage, they're just exquisite jewels. Birds are also excellent indicators of ecological health. So that the health, how well their populations are doing, indicates um, the, healthy, the health of the environment. And we humans are also dependent, if we're going to thrive, we are dependent also on having a healthy environment. So if bird populations are declining, there are certainly some uh, environmental problems. Birds perform a, what are called um, um, ecological services. They, some birds help pollinate flowers. Many birds disperse seeds. Many birds keep both insect and rodent pests under control. So our, the things that we take for granted are, are made in part are performed in part by birds and by other wildlife. So the, the study by Cornell, there was a 29% drop in abundance. They guesstimated since 1970 up through 2017 that bird populations in North America declined by 2.9 billion birds. I mean, this is really a precipitous drop, and it is quite, quite concerning. There are a number of things, though, that we as, as homeowners and as citizens can do. So the Cornell Lab of Ornithology has come up with seven simple actions to help birds, and I'll briefly talk about those. Uh, one thing is, I, I certainly drink coffee in the morning, but you can try to buy um, shade-grown coffee. So there's a lot of deforestation in the tropics, and some of these areas are cleared to grow sun coffee. Uh, but coffee grows also very well in shade, and the native trees that provide that shade are also habitat for birds. A lot of the songbirds that breed here, they're called neotropical migrants. That is, they breed in North America, but they migrate and spend the winter in Central and South America. And they need sufficient habitat on their wintering grounds. Uh, another thing you can do is use less plastic. Plastic is derived from petroleum, and in making plastic, greenhouse gases are released. And we're also finding uh, plastic pollution in the ocean, uh, in streams, on land. It, it is quite a problem. It, it does not degrade very easily at all. It will last in the environment a very long time. Another thing that you can do is practice citizen science. So if you bird watch, report your bird observations on something called eBird. Um, this actually helps scientists to track bird populations um, in North America. So a lot of birds, when they migrate, they migrate at night, the songbirds do, 
And then they, in the mornings and the next day, they'll feed to get more energy for the next step of their migration. But unfortunately, they will see a reflection in a window of the sky or of vegetation, and they attempt to fly into the window, and they, they fly into it and are killed. So the American, you can go on the website of the American Bird Conservancy. Um, there are things that you can place over your windows to, to, to make them visible to birds. Uh, certainly on our windows, we have large screens and the, the screens give enough so that when a bird hits it, it's the, the impact doesn't kill it. Um, another important thing, cats are wonderful pets. Um, certainly our son has a cat, but cats should be kept indoors. They are predators and outdoor cats kill an incredible number of birds and mammals. So I strongly encourage you to keep cats indoors. Another thing that you can do is to use native plants. So birds, uh, many birds feed on insects, caterpillars and so forth. These insects use native plants as hosts. So by having native plants, you're providing um, a food source for birds. And birds will also feed on the berries of the plants. And then uh, avoid using pesticides. And there's also studies that have documented that the number of insects, insect populations have also declined quite a bit. And of course, insects provide, are the food source for many species of birds. Um, certainly within the past 10 years or so, I've noticed that if I leave a light on at night outside, there are far fewer moths that are attracted to uh, our light. I think it's vital to reduce your carbon footprint. Um, global climate change is, is, it is a major problem affecting global humanity. Um, National Audubon Society has conducted a study and they, in North America alone, they have documented that 389 bird species can be severely harmed by climate change. So it's, it's, it's important to contact your representatives um, for an increase in the use of renewable energy, solar, wind, um, use energy efficient light bulbs, buy energy efficient vehicles. This is real important. And it's also climate change is an, is an existential threat for humanity. If it's unchecked, um, parts, parts of the earth will, will not be habitable. So we've landscaped our backyard. We have a lot of native plants. Uh, for example, here's purple coneflower. We attract a lot of, um, of butterflies and insects. And then the coneflowers, once they mature, form seeds. Goldfinches love seeds. You can leave dead trees for cavity nesting birds. Woodpeckers rely on them, and then other birds will, will nest in the old woodpecker cavities. Uh, screech owls, for example, are cavity nesting birds. I wanna thank our 11 volunteer surveyors. They, they put in a lot of time and effort and very appreciative of what they've done. And then I'll mention just another study that I'm conducting now with two Illinois Wesleyan students. I am live trapping and taking feather samples from wintering red-tailed hawks in Illinois. And I can have that feather sample chemically analyzed and I can determine if the hawks are year-round residents or if they're northern birds that are spending the winter here. Um, and I'll also give you basically a tip to, to help for, for marriage counseling during times of COVID. Um, spousal assistance is key to a happy marriage. This is my wife, Jean. She loves nature, although she's not quite driven to study birds the way that I do, but here she's holding a young uh, red-tailed hawk that I measured and weighed and, and took a feather sample. 
All right, so this ends my presentation and thanks for coming and I'm happy to uh, answer questions. And if you have any questions, feel free to enter them into the chat. I know early on we had a question um, given about what is a transect? Um, could you describe that? Sure, transect, it's basically a linear line that which you, you it's, it's some of the transects were, were close to a kilometer in length. And so every approximate 100 yards, we had a point. And we, we had those points in this, this um, linear transect. Great. Thank you. Uh, and then one other comment that uh, um, you reinforced as well uh, from Albert, and that was uh, a way to help birds is to keep cats inside. Um, so uh, Albert uh, beat you to the punch uh, on that uh, recommendation. Deanna Frouchy would like to know, I know some robins overwinter rather than migrating. Um, how do they decide? You know, I, I, I think on average winters have been warmer. And so uh, I think though what really allows robins, cedar waxwings, other birds to persist here is that in, in the cities, we have planted um, a lot of, of trees that have winter fruits. For example, crab apples. Um, robins norm, you know, will eat worms and invertebrates in the summer. In the winter, they eat a lot of fruits. Um, sometimes, you know, though, if, if we get a, a real nasty winter and a cold snap, if they're unable to migrate, you'll, you'll have some mortality but robins are short distance migrants. So they, they typically would migrate to Southern Illinois or perhaps Kentucky. Great. Any other questions uh, for Given before uh, we um, wrap things up? Okay, Jeff, do you wanna take it over? Sure, I just wanna say uh, thank you Given for uh, sharing this information with us today. Uh, particularly the, uh, the relationship between conservation and birding. Uh, I think that's really important. And I'm a bird watcher myself. So, Good. and I also want to just, uh, as always, thank Carl Teichman and uh, Illinois Wesleyan um, for all that they do uh, to put on this presentation. And in the background here, we have our uh, Director of Education, Candace Summers, who is doing the tech for us today. Uh, we appreciate you as well. And then we just want to just invite everyone to join us next month, January 14th, as we'll um, be asking the question, what does Fido know inside the mind of the dog with Ellen Furlong? Again, thank you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Gibbon. Sure, thank you. Well.